migration again was always an interest because I grew up in a part of the UK that has experienced um, several generations of migration from South Asia, mainly from Pakistan, from the northern parts, the Kashmir parts, as a Kashmir in Pakistan. So I went to school with lots of British Pakistanis, and again, those. Uh, different varieties of English were always a reality in the schools that I attended and in the friendships that I developed. Um, and then uh, many years later, when I was working on teacher development projects in Pakistan, um, I could sort of see the, the other end then of the trajectory uh, of the ways that English provides opportunities for the people that can speak English and can use English and the, the varieties of English that have, have power in those settings and what it means to then use your English to migrate to countries like the UK. The original idea Sorry. for the language and migration textbook came about because I was looking for resources for a module that I teach, a, a part three BA and MA module in our uh, English language and applied linguistics programs. And I was looking for source material for that particular module. And the module I cover, I try to take a historical perspective, looking at the ways that human beings have always moved around the world and what that's meant for culture and trade and moving into then more recent, the more recent past, thinking about colonialism and, and, and the consequences of colonialism on language policy in, in different parts of the world and language use in different parts of the world. And then trying to, again, to, to, to see some of the connections between colonialism and globalization, what's new about globalization, what's not so new, and ultimately trying to help students understand how we research this complexity. So the idea of a textbook was a way of going into some depth about these different phases, perhaps, of human migration and mobility. Um, so starting by looking back and then in the later chapters, using more recent work on globalization theory um, to explore contemporary migration, but also to explore the linguistic repertoires of, of all the students in the class. It, it, um, it was an important part of the, of the module and of the textbook to feel, uh, to, to help students feel that all of their different linguistic resources were valued. So teaching in the UK, we have a lot of students who would describe themselves as monolingual. Uh, but of course, within that, there is lots of variation around styles and registers and the genres that they need to master as being uh, part of being a, um, a student in the UK. So the, the textbook sounds like it's about migrants or migration. It is, but it's also a way of helping students tap into their own repertoires and see how we're, we're all constantly mixing. We're, we're all trying to master different ways of communicating, different written modes, different spoken modes. So um, the book really was a response to trying to find resources that would help people who have very clear migrant backgrounds and students who perhaps don't have recent migrants within their immediate family, but whose own repertoires will have been shaped by mobility. The work on translanguaging has been really useful to understand migrants' very mixed linguistic practices. I think when migrants go online, whenever everyone goes online, regardless of their migrant background or, or not, they are mixing different styles and different registers. So again, a way into being able to work with that complexity um, theories around translanguaging, which help us look beyond the level of code and, and look at the more discursive level, look at identities and how people 
construct identities when they come together in, in translingual interactions. Um, it's been a very useful way of helping students of language and migration understand their own repertoires and understand how migrants bring together these different linguistic resources. So some of the case studies in the textbook language and migration draw on research in digital settings where, for example, migrants who have Punjabi and Urdu in their repertoires, they're able to come up with scripts. In Pakistan, Punjabi isn't a written language. It's used at home uh, when families talk together. It, it's, it, you don't see it often written down. So online, by using um, the you know, Roman script, some migrants are able to then use that script as a way of communicating in Punjabi, but most Punjabi Urdu speakers won't just be only using Punjabi, they'll be mixing with Urdu. And of course, England is so present now um, in, in many different kinds of families that there'll also be examples of English alongside these other varieties.